In some ways, the gameplay of Breath of the Wild can feel at odds with its narrative. Here we have a story about the destruction of an entire kingdom, of horrific devastation and loss of life, the looming threat of a second disaster on the horizon, the final snuffing out of life in this land which is perhaps only days away. The potential end of all life is approaching. This is a dire situation. If you took the story seriously, you should feel anxious, you should be rushing to stop calamity Ganon as soon as possible, but that's not how most of us played the game. Most of us spent hours and hours just farting around collecting Korok seeds, solving little side quests, searching for treasure. There is no anxiety in this gameplay, there is no rush. The lackadaisical game design encourages you to take your time. This world is not an anxious one, not even a very violent one. The world of Breath of the Wild feels peaceful. It's very pretty. The soft color palette, all the wild nature everywhere, the quiet, low-tempo soundtrack, it can all be very soothing. It's a world that I want to spend a lot of time in. It's a world that relaxes me. When I first played the game, I thought this tragic story and peaceful fun gameplay didn't match each other at all. But nowadays I think it's actually the opposite. Those two seemingly contradictory elements are really essential to each other. Because Breath of the Wild story is at its core, a story about failure and tragedy, but also about overcoming that failure, about finding joy and beauty in the world even after a tragedy has occurred, finding reasons to live in a tragic world. I'm going to start this essay by discussing the game's world design, this peaceful playground the developers have created, and then discussing the horror that underlies that seemingly peaceful world, and then how the narrative's themes of failure and overcoming failure tie it all together. So, Breath of the Wild's gameplay, like a lot of Nintendo games, is all about joy and silliness and finding the fun in all these little details. These little interactions with the world that most other games wouldn't bother with. Despite its massive scale, its huge open world, its story that spans millennia, with the fate of the entire world at stake, Breath of the Wild often feels to me like a very small-scale game. So much about its game mechanics and world design are about finding fun in little things. I was at my happiest in this game when I was simply exploring a little green shaded wood, picking some mushrooms off the ground, seeing squirrels and birds skittering among the underbrush, climbing a tree and finding a bird's nest, while that delightful little bit of piano music plays, and the wind is rustling and you hear the tittering of the birds. You can chop the trees down for wood, you can pick apples for food, you can even accidentally light the whole place on fire. Or when I climbed a tall hill or small mountain and you look out and it feels like this whole world is spread out beneath you, and the terrain is rolling and so very green, and maybe it's sunset and the landscape has turned pink, or maybe it's raining and atmospheric, but either way, every vista in this game felt like its own reward. Every landscape a painting, and every single thing you can see, every tree, every mountain, every valley, that's a place you can go right now. There's a wonderful sense of freedom to it. Or when I was exploring some ruins, some hundred-year-old crumbling fortress, littered with moss-covered husks of ancient broken machines, left over from a forgotten battle, or maybe an abandoned village where every single villager is long gone, or even just a single lonely shack on a green hill, and letting my imagination loose, imagining what life might have been like in this place before all the death and destruction, when every fortress was manned by marching soldiers and every village was alive with the sounds of work and play, and even those lonely shacks were inhabited by some family, some old hermit living on the frontier. I've often heard people describe Breath of the Wild's open world as empty, or say that there wasn't enough to do or not enough to find. And while I do understand those criticisms, and I think there's some validity to them, I also believe there is something difficult to describe within this game's world design that if you don't get it, you just don't get it. I like riding my horse along the paths, I like climbing the hills, I like collecting mushrooms or hunting for deer, I like jumping off a tower and seeing how far I can glide. There is a simple joy in these acts that feel silly and pointless when you try to explain them to others, but in the moment feel very satisfying and fun. You have to experience it for yourself, you have to let yourself take it slow, give yourself permission to waste time and not even bother trying to accomplish anything. Just enjoy meandering around this beautiful and usually peaceful playground the developers have gifted to us. Breath of the Wild reminds me a lot of Studio Ghibli's films. A lot of those movies have these grand, exciting adventure stories 
stories, but the films are never really about that, or at least didn't seem so to me. Those movies are all about these little quiet moments, these often mundane daily events, and because of that studio's extraordinary animation, those otherwise mundane moments become filled with so much color and joy and life. Watching those scenes can make you feel happy just to be alive, and that's the true secret of their magic. Breath of the Wild feels like a 300 hour long video game equivalent of that. The game's world is full of so much color and so much life and so much quiet joy. It's part of why I'm a bit flabbergasted when people say this game is empty or shallow. Every inch of this game's world feels absolutely full to me. And yet, as I discussed at the beginning of this video, all that peaceful gameplay can feel at odds with the game's narrative. Breath of the Wild's story is one of deep tragedy. This is a setting where the heroes failed, where the champions of good were cut down one by one, where the bad guys were victorious where innocent lives were destroyed, where thousands were slaughtered, where the kingdom fell to fire and ruin. Everywhere you go in this game, you see the lingering scars of a cataclysmic battle, abandoned villages, crumbling fortresses, battlefields where the earth itself has been shattered. Every time I pass a ruin in this setting, an abandoned home, an empty cobblestone street where wild grass grows between the stones and none but monsters now roam, I feel like I'm exploring a graveyard. Each ruin is like a gravestone, a monument marking where another life was lost forever. Breath of the Wild's whole world feels like one big graveyard. For all its life and light and color, it is also a melancholy setting where the twin shadows of death and ruin are ever present. As an audience, how do we reconcile these two seemingly disparate story elements? Life and death, joy and loss, color and shadow. I think the primary theme of Breath of the Wild's narrative is failure, tragedy, and disaster. But also finding a way to keep going in spite of those. Finding a reason to keep living in a tragic world. Overcoming failure, building a new life in this broken place. And not necessarily repairing all the damage that has been done, because that isn't really possible. You can't break bring back all the lives that have been lost, but instead finding a way to live with the damage, with the old wounds, joyfully and peacefully. Let's look at a seemingly random background character in the game. In Hateno Village, the only Hyrulean village that escaped the devastation of the Calamity mostly unscathed, you can find this old woman sitting by a tree. She speaks about the setting and history of this world, which is a relative rarity in the game. It's hard to find characters who actually say anything substantial about the setting's backstory, anything specific about how the calamity affected the lives of ordinary people who survived the devastation. She says, When I was a child, this whole region wasn't in a state fit to be sown, much less harvested. Hyrule Castle and Castle Town had been destroyed, and all the lovely folks folks there fell victim to. Well, back in the bygone days, we called it the Calamity. But words often fall meaningless when we try to describe tragic events of a certain magnitude. I didn't come along until everything was already over. I was born during the age of burning fields. By the time I was old enough to be aware of it, the plants around Hateno Village were budding. We were self-sufficient. This dialogue is so important to understanding the setting of Breath of the Wild and to its themes of both failure and overcoming failure that I kind of can't can't believe it was hidden behind some random NPC in the corner of Hateno Village where it can easily be missed. I want to start with that line. Words often fall meaningless when we try to describe tragic events of a certain magnitude. There is a profound truth to this statement. Our language often fails to capture the emotions and the trauma of tragedies. It is difficult enough to describe in words how it feels when you lose a single person you love. But what about when you lose tens of thousands, when you lose entire cities and towns, when you lose your whole world in a day? What words are there for that? The word the word calamity specifically is not sufficient to capture the scope and terror of the tragedy the term is used to describe. I think a lot of players don't really grasp the horror and trauma of the calamity, and that's at least partly because the word itself doesn't adequately grasp that horror and trauma. It's not a failure of the writers, but of the language itself. And that's part of the challenge of telling a story about a tragedy on the scale of the calamity. What words can you use to describe this disaster to get your audience to truly understand it. 
For the most part, Breath of the Wild doesn't use words at all. Instead, it uses the environment itself to tell the story, and that is a really effective choice, but I'll discuss that more in a bit. First, I want to keep talking to this old lady. Let's look at her lines. When I was a child, this whole region wasn't in a state fit to be sown, much less harvested, and I was born during the age of the burning fields. The calamity didn't stop with the battle between the soldiers and the guardians, didn't stop with the raising of Castle Town, didn't stop with the destruction of so many settlements, didn't even stop when Princess Zelda successfully sealed Ganon inside the castle. The devastation wrought during the great battles continued even after those battles were over. The fires must have raged on for weeks or even months, destroying more than the battle itself had. The earth and waters were burnt or poisoned. Wildlife must have experienced a dramatic decline. For a time, it became impossible to grow food in the ruined soil. Try to imagine this. Your home has been destroyed. Your friends and family are dead. Even when you find safety, everything has been burned. You can't grow food. And all the wild food you might scavenge has been burned and the wildlife you might have hunted is dead or fled, and even the fish in the rivers have been poisoned by ash and debris. How do you keep going? How do you even find a reason to keep struggling, to keep on living? Wouldn't it be so much easier to just give up? And yet they didn't give up. They did keep going, as people always do. After every tragedy in our world's history, in every time and every place, after every natural disaster and every war and every massacre, there are always survivors. Somehow, people always find a way to keep on living. There is an inherent tenacity to life, and I think that is central to Breath of the Wild's story. Understanding that tenacity, understanding why we keep going, understanding all the joy and beauty that can still be felt even after a terrible tragedy has taken so much from us. But before I dig more deeply into that, I want to talk to this old lady just a little bit more. If you ask her about Hyrule Castle, she will say, Brave souls from nearby villages would all set their sights there, do great deeds, and return home draped in glory. I really like this line because it's one of the few lines of dialogue in the game that gives us any idea of what daily life in Hyrule Kingdom was like before the Calamity, of their culture and what they valued. Hyrule Castle was not just at the geographic center of the kingdom, but the center of its culture too. If you had dreams, they were of Hyrule Castle. If you left home, you went to Hyrule Castle. If you wanted to become someone, make a name for yourself, find glory, you searched for it at Hyrule Castle. All eyes were pointed towards that single landmark. All those ruined and abandoned villages across the landscape, in every single one of those villages you could have found young people with goals and aspirations, greedy for glory, hungry for success, ready to take on the world, and their eyes were pointed towards Hyrule Castle. In those same villages you'd find older folks who had once left and later returned, who could regale others with stories of their adventures, of their careers as knights of the kingdom, of some battle or crisis they took part in. Across the whole kingdom, on all the roads and highways, you could have found people journeying to Hyrule Castle for the first time, their hearts high with hope. I think it's important to try to understand what life in Hyrule Kingdom was like so we can understand what was lost, to see the humanity within this tragedy. The story focuses so much on Link, the great fabled hero, and on Princess Zelda, and on the champions, but we get so little information about the ordinary people of Hyrule Kingdom. But now we need to move on. I spoke before about how Breath of the Wild tells most of its story through its environment, through the landscape itself, so if we really want to understand the story of the Calamity, and those themes of failure and overcoming failure, of the inherent tenacity of human life, we have to find it by reading the environment the same way we might read a book or analyze a painting. I want to focus on three specific locations in the game, and the stories those locations tell. I want to look at Hateno Village, a Colosseum in Castle Town. So since we're already there, let's start with Hateno Village. Hateno Village's story actually begins far outside the village itself, in a place called the Blatchery Plain. This plain was the site of the last battle of the Calamity, and you can tell just by reading the landscape how terrible and horrific this battle was. Examine the shape of the landscape here. Look at all these little hills and dips, the shallow puddles, the way the whole plain seems to have been pockmarked. Now, this is a photo of 
what the World War I battlefield of Verdun looks like today, you should immediately see the similarities. About a hundred years ago, one of the most terrible battles in human history was fought here, and even a hundred years later, the scars of that battle still run deep. The craters dug by tens of thousands of artillery blasts are still obvious to the naked eye. Hundreds of thousands of soldiers lost their lives here. And this is exactly what we see in the Blatchery Plain, a landscape that never healed from the battle that was fought here where the craters dug by the blasts from the Guardian's weapons still pockmark the landscape. The Earth itself was wounded, permanently altered. It wasn't just human lives that suffered in the calamity, it was the world, too. It was the ecosystem. You can look at this landscape and see the battle that was fought here. The scars in the land will probably never fully heal. This isn't a story about healing and covering up old wounds. It's a story about learning to live with the wounds. And this battlefield is massive. Look how far it extends. Look how many husks of guardians rest here. Next, examine the human ruins that dot this plain. Here and there you see crooked walls, archways that lead to nowhere, a lone pillar supporting nothing. These buildings have been so thoroughly destroyed that you can't even guess at what they might have been. Was all of this a part of Fort Hateno? Could there have been a village here too, something else? There is no way to know. It's not just that all of the people who lived here are dead, it's that the calamity even erased the stories of their lives. Their stories were not written down, and these structures were completely demolished, so that we cannot read their stories even in the environment. Their lives have vanished, we will never know anything about them. Much of what was lost in the calamity is simply irrecoverable, just like any other disaster. At the far end of the plain, we find this stone fortification, and this wall is really extraordinary, because it marks the calamity's greatest extent. That wave of destruction and bloodshed and terror and battle crashed into this fort and was held back long enough for Princess Zelda's magical power to shut down the Guardians. Look how many Guardians are piled up against this wall. How many were destroyed midway through the act of actually climbing the fortification. The scars in the wall itself. And yet not a single Guardian ever managed to scale this wall. Not a single one reached the other side. We know that Link fought in this battle, that he destroyed many of these Guardians himself. And that it was Princess Zelda who ultimately ended the battle with a massive blast of magical power. But look at this wall, and think about how many soldiers must have fought on this wall. How many soldiers it would have taken to hold back a horde of guardians for any length of time. How many heroes fought here whose names we'll never know and whose stories were never told. But even if they weren't written down, we can still see their stories. The developers stamped this story into the landscape instead. From here, we travel along the road to Hateno Village itself. Notice how empty this road is, how few travelers there are, how the road is just a path worn into the dirt from frequent travel. This might as well be a rural road leading to nowhere. Today, Hateno Village is the center of Hyrulean civilization, the densest human settlement in the world. But before the Calamity, it was just a village on the outskirts, one of many, in an isolated corner of the frontier, not even important enough to warrant a cobblestone road. And then we reach Hateno Village itself, and we find what all those heroes at the fort sacrificed their lives for. It's life, it's simple living. Hateno wasn't a center of culture or knowledge. It wasn't strategically important. There isn't anything special about Hateno that makes it worth sacrificing your life for, except that it's a place where people lived. Here, farmers still till the fields, children still run and play in the streets, mothers still gather to gossip by the well, the windmills still turn. In spite of all that death and ruin, life goes on. I started this essay by discussing all the simple and small joys there are to be found in Breath of the Wild's world design, despite the tragedy. And I think Hateno is central to that theme. In the end, the soldiers of Hyrule didn't save the castle, and they didn't save any libraries, and they didn't save any temples, and they didn't save any fortresses. They saved a single village, one village, where those simple and small joys can carry on. I really love Hateno Village. It's one of my favorite locations in the game. It's so peaceful here, so relaxing. Here you don't have to imagine what life might have been like before the calamity. You can see it with your own eyes. It was simple and quiet, normal. The villagers live ordinary lives here, follow uncomplicated routines. 
I think there's much to be envied about life in this place. At Hateno, through the environment, we see a story of heroes facing incredible devastation, horrific tragedy, and against all odds, just barely emerging victorious. Of great sacrifice for simple rewards. Now we need to move on to a more tragic story. One of heroes failing, falling in battle, of the soldiers who died without saving anything. Now we move on to Akala Citadel. Akala is a rural frontier region full of nature and wetlands and quarries and trees with absolutely gorgeous red-colored leaves. And over all this wildlife, the massive ruined spire of Akala Citadel looms. Akala Citadel is one of the most impressive sights in all of Hyrule. Colossal stone walls that stretch high into the sky. A multi-leveled, multi-terraced fortress complex carved into the face of a cliff. Seemingly impregnable, the toughest nut to crack in all the kingdom. Once upon a time, it must have been home to hundreds of soldiers, a focal point of Hyrule's military forces. But now it is quiet. The only life to be found here today are monsters, and the trees growing from the terraces, their red-colored leaves swaying in the cold wind. First, imagine the story of its builders. A master architect must have designed this structure, one of the most impressive minds of their age, who designed a fortress that would stand for generations. And yet, whose name we will never know. It would have taken months just to gather the materials from the nearby quarry, and many more months, if not years, for the craftsmen and laborers to raise the tower into the sky. Slowly, piece by piece, stone by stone, brick by brick, it rose ever higher. Imagine the pride of that architect when the final brick was set in its place. The pride of all those craftsmen and laborers. To have been a part of building one of the most incredible landmarks in the land. Imagine how the hearts of everyone in Hyrule must have swelled with that pride. Upon seeing this testament to their power, to their strength, to their wealth, to what they could achieve when they worked together in shared and driven purpose. Imagine how safe they must have felt knowing this titanic fortress was protecting them. And now they're all gone. This fortress did not protect them. All their power, all their strength failed during the calamity. To learn more about the story of Akala Citadel, let's speak to this NPC who's hanging out near the entrance. He says, That's the Akala Citadel ruins. Long ago, at the peak of Hyrule's power, they built a fortress to protect Akala. It was said to be unassailable, but during the Great Calamity, Hyrule Castle fell. The army had no royalty to lead them. With no other choice, they fell back to the Citadel to make their last stand. Sadly, a concentrated assault from the out-of-control guardians spelled the end for this fortress too. In a real sense, the Kingdom of Hyrule met its doom here. When the unthinkable occurred, when the center of their civilization, Hyrule Castle, fell, the survivors, battered and beaten, broken, fled to this citadel. Try to picture the stream of refugees that poured into this fortress that day, of terrified villagers and townspeople who had barely escaped with their lives, of soldiers who had no kingdom left to defend and didn't know where else to go. Many of them must have been wounded, many of them must have gotten separated from their families and loved ones, hope to be reunited with them behind these walls. All of them must have been scared, all of them must have been in shock, all of them must have wondered if even Hyrule Castle had fallen, what chance did Akala Citadel have of withstanding the next assault? Then imagine their growing despair as more and more guardians appeared over the horizon. Unstoppable, gathered at the fortress's base. The panic, the screams, the hopeless final stand. Some must have tried to hide. Some must have thrown themselves from the walls in their attempts to escape. Some would have fought to their last breath. Maybe they even held off the first wave, the second, the third, the fourth. But the guardians were ceaseless, innumerable. Every man, woman, and child who fled here was slaughtered. The Guardians were a merciless and compassionless enemy, inhuman. You couldn't even beg for your life. The Guardians wouldn't hear your pleas, wouldn't even understand them, and wouldn't care if they did. I talked before about how the ruins in this setting often seem like grave markers to me. Like the whole kingdom is one sprawling graveyard, and each ruin is the marker of a life lost. Well, Akala Citadel is the most massive gravestone at all, marking the final hopeless and terrifying moment of the entire kingdom. And yet, if from the top of this tower you gaze east, 
towards Lake Akala, you'll see something very beautiful. That's Terrytown, the first new settlement built in Hyrule Kingdom in a hundred years. Beneath the shadow of this old citadel, this terrible gravestone, all those old horrors and tragedies, new life is emerging. The people of Hyrule are beginning to rebuild. Terrytown is another of my favorite locations in the game, because you get to help build it. You get to watch this new village grow house by house, villager by villager, from a lonely and empty plateau into a place full of life and color. If I had more time, I would talk a lot more about the Terrytown side quest, how it represents the renewal of Hyrule, many species and cultures working together, how the wedding at the end marks not only the joining of that couple, but the moment Hyrule Kingdom itself was reborn right here in Akala, the same place it died. But this essay is already running long and we have so much more to get to. Remember, Breath of the Wild's main themes aren't just failure and tragedy, but also overcoming that failure and tragedy, which is perfectly represented by Terrytown blossoming beneath the shadow of Akala Citadel. Next, we move to the center of Hyrule Kingdom, the epicenter of the Calamity, where all this death and destruction started to Castle Town. We've actually been following the story in reverse order. The Calamity began at Castle Town, then spread to the surrounding settlements and fortresses, including Akala Citadel, and then was finally just barely halted at Fort Hateno by Princess Zelda's magic. For most players, Castle Town will be the last area in the game they explore, because it's the most dangerous ruin in all of Hyrule. The former capital of the greatest kingdom in the world is now a gray and featureless, lifeless wasteland, where pools of acidic malice burn anything they touch, and ancient guardians patrol these silent charnel streets, assaulting anyone foolish enough to explore this most ruined of all ruins. Castle Town was the only true city of Hyrule Kingdom, the center of of its culture, government, and civilization. This is where the royalty dwelt. This is where the bravest and most accomplished knights served. This is where the most learned and gifted scholars gathered. A hundred years ago, the streets must have been dense and crowded and noisy and alive with hundreds of people, with the sounds of talking and shouting and music and dogs barking and children playing, and shopkeepers hawking their wares, and the thousands of footsteps and the horses' hooves clattering on the cobblestones, and the creaky wheels of the carriages and carts. And now it is utterly silent. Unlike Akala Citadel, where at least the red leaved trees still grow, here in Castle Town there is no life at all, not even trees, not even monsters. The only thing that moves here are the mechanical corrupted guardians, artificial imitations of life, death machines who serve only evil. The most remarkable thing to me about the ruins of Castle Town is how utterly and totally this place has been destroyed. Most buildings have been literally leveled to the ground, down to their very foundations. This city looks like it was hit by an atomic bomb. This is where the calamity began, its epicenter, where it struck the hardest. And so the devastation here is visibly far worse than anywhere else. One moment, life here was as busy and colorful and noisy as ever, and then in the next, thousands of rogue guardians dropped on top of the city, clambering over the rooftops, swarming through the streets, destroying absolutely everything in sight. Castle Town was probably destroyed in minutes, if not mere seconds. It would have been horrific. Hundreds, if not thousands of children must have been killed in these streets within the first seconds of the calamity, burned or vaporized along with their mothers and fathers, their grandparents, even their family pets. Imagine it. One moment you're living your life, you're thinking about whatever little ordinary worries that all people think about. Money, relationships, your family, your job, what you're going to eat for lunch that day, what you're going to do when you get home, your chores, your hobbies. And then in the next moment, absolutely everything you ever knew has been destroyed. Even if you are lucky enough to survive, your life is is already gone forever. Your entire world is gone forever. Even if you survive the first few minutes, escape from the city, there is nowhere you can flee to, nowhere you will be safe. The Guardians followed the stream of refugees that fled to Akala Citadel, slaughtered every single one of them. The Guardians scattered in every direction, 
carrying destruction to every village, every fortress, every lone cottage. Even if you survived, how could you find a way to keep going after this happened to you? That is the central question of Breath of the Wild's story, but it's not a question unique to this game. This destruction of cities is obviously not unique to the fictional setting of Breath of the Wild. Cities all across the world, in every country, have experienced this exact type of total devastation. Cities are being destroyed in this exact way right Right now, this very minute, in parts of our world. Right now, lives are being destroyed, worlds are being destroyed. Tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people are, are asking that same question. How do we keep going in a world where tragedies like this keep happening? We will never see the last war or natural disaster. We will never see the last ruined city, the last stream of hopeless refugees. It's a personal question that everyone must answer for themselves, but we've already seen Breath of the Wild's answer. We've seen it written in the settings landscapes. I spent the first part of this video showing you that answer, in all the joy and fun and peace still left to be found in this ruined world. Breath of the Wild is a world where, even after the worst of tragedies, the most horrific loss of life imaginable, you can still feel joy, still appreciate beauty, still have fun. Breath of the Wild is a world where life is tenacious, where people do not give up, where eventually, against all all odds, they survive, rebuild, and even thrive beneath the shadows of the old tragedies. Before I end this video, I want to discuss Princess Zelda's story. So far, we've only looked at how Breath of the Wild tells this story through its environment. This whole time, we've had to imagine what the Hyruleans did and what emotions they felt, infer all that from the details of the environment. But with Princess Zelda, we don't have to imagine anything. Princess Zelda puts a human face on all that shock and trauma and destruction destruction, on the effects of tragedy and failure, on those themes of failure and overcoming failure. She personalizes it. She allows us to see the calamity through a single character's eyes. Now, I don't want to watch every single one of her cutscenes, because then we'd be here all day. Instead, I've curated a sequence of four cutscenes featuring Zelda, which I think do a really good job of telling her story. Telling this story of failure and then overcoming that failure. So let's watch the first one. Incredible. We're at a point now where we can actually control them. At the current rate, we'll soon know all we need to know about the Guardians and the Divine Beasts. And should Ganon never show itself again, we'll be well positioned to defend ourselves. What are you doing out here, Zelda? I was assessing the results of the experiment with the Guardians. These pieces of ancient technology could be quite useful against them. I know that. They are essential to Hyrule's future, and our research demands that we keep a close eye on them. However, as the princess, you currently have a crucial unfulfilled responsibility to your kingdom. <sighs> Let me ask you once more, when will you stop treating this as some sort of childish game? I'm doing everything I can. Uh, I'll have you know that I just recently returned from the Spring of Courage, where I offered every ounce of my prayers to the Goddess. And now you are here, wasting your time. You need to be dedicating every moment you have to your training. You must be single-minded in unlocking the power that will seal Calamity Ganon away. I already am. Don't you see? There's nothing more I can do. My hope... My hope is that you... that you'll allow me to contribute here, in whatever way I can- No more excuses, Zelda. Stop running away from your duty. As the King, I forbid you to have anything to do with these machines from this moment on, and command you to focus on your training. Do you know how the Gossip Mongers refer to you? They are out there at this moment, whispering amongst themselves that you are the heir to a throne of nothing, nothing but failure. It is woven into your destiny that you prove them wrong. Do you understand? Yes, 
I understand. Breath of the Wild's story is very unique among the franchise in that it presents Princess Zelda as fundamentally a failure. In most other games, she is depicted as powerful, wise, in charge of whatever situation she's in. Sure, she also usually gets kidnapped, but she always has total control over her magical power. She never struggles to use her magic. That always seems second nature to her, but not in Breath of the Wild. This is a more sympathetic depiction of her character than we're used to. A character who is failing to live up to others' expectations of her, who is failing to fulfill her supposed destiny. Princess Zelda has been told that the only means of saving the kingdom lies within herself, a hidden power sleeping within her. But she doesn't have any idea how to awaken that power. She doesn't have anyone to guide her or instruct her in this. She is alone and time is running out. If she fails to awaken that power, then everything will fail. Everything will be destroyed. It doesn't help that she's been forcefully paired with Link, a warrior who has seemingly very easily fallen into his own destiny as the chosen chosen hero. Every time she views his success, it's a reminder of her own failure. She tries to distract herself with research into the ancient guardians, studying and restoring the old Sheikah technology, which is a space where she can succeed, a place where she isn't haunted by her failure, where she can feel confident in herself. But then, even that safe haven is stolen from her when her father forbids her from further research into the guardians, throws her failures in her face, orders her to focus totally on her training from now on. But this is a brutal order. Imagine Imagine being ordered to spend your every waking moment working on something that you simply cannot achieve. No matter how much time you spend on it, no matter how hard you try, it would make you miserable. Which is exactly what Zelda becomes, miserable. Now let's watch the next scene to see how this story of failure progresses. I come seeking help. Regarding this power that has been handed down over time, prayer will awaken my power to seal Ganon away. Or so I've been told all my life. And yet... Grandmother heard them. The voices from the spirit realm. And Mother said her own power would develop within me. But I don't hear or feel anything. Father has told me time and time again. He always says, quit wasting your time playing at being a scholar. Curse you. I've spent every day of my life dedicated to praying. I've pleaded to the spirits tied to the ancient gods. And still the holy powers have proven deaf to my devotion. Please, just tell me. What is it? What's wrong with me? In this scene, we see the deep personal anguish that repeated failure can cause. How long can you fail at something before you must give up? For the sake of your own mental and emotional health, for the sake of your future? This is a serious question. This is a question that people face every single day. Everyone who is trying to accomplish anything has to answer this question. If you're trying to start a business or trying to be a professional athlete or trying to make a living as an artist or writer and it's not working, how long can you fail before you just have to give up? How many years of failure? How many failed attempts? How many rejections can you go through before you can't take any more? What is the correct number? Failure can make you sick. Deep down inside, it can hurt you. Just as Zelda does here, you will begin to wonder what is wrong with you. What about you is broken? Why can you not do what other people have done? How can you fix it? Can it ever be fixed? In this scene, Zelda is approaching that limit. This is a character who is asking herself, how how many more times can I fail? How many more times can I put myself through this? What's even the point of trying anymore? Next, let's watch the result of all this failure. Did it come to this? The divine. 
fine beasts. The guardians, they've all turned against us. It was Calamity Ganon. It turned them all against us. And everyone, Mipha, Rebosa, Rivali and Daruk, they're all trapped inside those things. It's all my fault. Our only hope for defeating Ganon is lost. All because I couldn't harness this cursed power. Everything, everything I've done up until now, it was all for nothing. So I really am just a failure. All my friends, the entire kingdom, my father most of all. I tried and I failed them all. I left them all to die. This scene takes place after the Calamity has begun, after Castletown has been destroyed, after the champions were killed. I talked before about how Zelda's story puts a much needed face on the tragedy of the Calamity. We've already seen the story of the destruction, the slaughter, the loss of life, the loss of everything. We've seen that story written into the environment. Notice how none of these awakened memory cutscenes actually show us almost any of the terror or destruction of the Calamity. Here, the two characters are just running in the woods. There are no guardians, no explosions, no fires, no screams, no refugees, no dead bodies. Bodies. These scenes don't need to show us any of that horror, because we've already seen it all written into the environment. Instead, these cutscenes need to show us something that the environmental storytelling cannot do, and that's emotions. That's a single character's personal emotional reaction to all this terror and hopelessness, which is exactly what we get from Zelda here. In some ways, in this scene, she is serving as a stand-in for the entire kingdom. It's not just her failure, it's not just her loss. Every single person in Hyrule, or at least everyone who has survived this long, is feeling the same emotion at this moment. Despair, utter and total despair and hopelessness. Zelda's character gives those feelings a face, an outlet, a single sympathetic character through whom we can experience those emotions ourselves. What do you think would be a more effective way of showing the emotional toll of the calamity? With a cutscene that shows thousands of people fleeing and terror from fires and destruction, or with a cutscene like this one that shows a single character's personal anguish, up close and intimate. Telling the story this way makes the devastation and the trauma personal, human, individual. Also, notice how many times the words fail and failure are repeated in these scenes. The writers are really hitting the audience in the head with the main theme of this story. But this isn't just a story about failure. It's also a story about overcoming failure. And that's what we'll see in this next scene. Here is where Zelda's power finally awakens, and it's worth noting that her blast of magical power here saves both Hateno Village and whatever soldiers were left defending that wall we saw earlier. The difference between this and every other time she's ever tried to awaken that power 
is that this time she's not doing it for herself, not doing it to fulfill her father's expectations, not doing it to fulfill some ancient duty. This time she's fighting to save someone she cares about. This time she's doing it for someone else. This time it's selfless. Her power only works when she's fighting for others. And I think this is central to the story's themes. A key question of Breath of the Wild's story is, how do we keep going after a tragedy? What reason can we find to keep living after we've lost everything? This scene contains a new answer to that question, and that answer has to do with companionship friendship, community, love. When tragedy strikes, we are reminded how much we rely on community. You can't rebuild a city all on your own. Lone survivors aren't really survivors. Zelda's power only works when she's fighting to save others because, thematically, we only overcome failure and tragedy when we overcome them together. Breath of the Wild story is a very optimistic one. In this story, when the critical moment arrives, when all hope seems lost, people do fight to save each other, and because they're fighting for others instead of for themselves, they will win. To finish this very long video, I'd like to watch just one more short scene. I want to fast forward to the very end of the game, to the secret post credit scene that you only see if you find every single memory. We'll make our way to Zora's domain. Divine Beast Varuta. Looks like it stopped working. Let's investigate the situation. Mitha's father. I believe he would like to hear more about her. The least we can do is visit him and offer him some closure. Although Ganon is gone for now, there is still so much more for us to do, and so many painful memories that we must bear. I believe in my heart that if all of us work together, we can restore Hyrule to its former glory. Perhaps even beyond, but it all must start with us. Let's be off. This scene makes the themes of the story even more explicit. That idea that in order to overcome tragedy, we need to work together. The scene begins with Zelda saying that she wants to meet with Mipha's father to offer him some comfort, some closure, which is absolutely essential to healing from this sort of tragedy and to the grieving process. And then she very explicitly says, if we all work together, we can restore Hyrule, which is the same as saying, if we all work together, we can restore our we can heal. I believe this is the path through any tragedy. When times are easy, you can survive on your own. But when times are tough, you need a community. A lot of times, I'll see people say that Breath of the Wild has no story. And that's a very perplexing statement to me. Sure, it doesn't have much in the way of long cutscenes or even much dialogue. Its characters are all pretty simple. The good guys are good and the bad guys are bad. The story itself is straightforward and easy to understand. Most of the time, you're playing in this game, you'll just be wandering around its world, not really interacting with any other characters, but instead finding shrines and treasures. And I can understand why, if you're not paying close attention, it can feel like there's no storytelling happening in those moments. But that's not true. The world you're exploring and playing in is the story. The world is the story. The setting is the story. Breath of the Wild's environments are dense with narrative. Almost everywhere you look, you can see this game's story. You can read it in the silent ruins, in the husks of the ancient guardians, in the battlefields where the earth itself has been scarred, and in the life that still thrives in spite of that disaster, if you look closely. And everywhere you look, the same story is being told. A story about tragedy and failure, and of a people who overcame that tragedy by fighting for each other instead of for themselves. 